A remote part of Kenya's coast tragically sprang into the spotlight around a year ago as a cult-like group calling itself Good News International was exposed. The leader of the group preached that the only way to the afterlife was through death by starvation, setting the stage for what came to be known as the Shakahola Forest Deaths. Over 400 bodies have since been recovered. Now, cults have been in existence for hundreds of years. Their leaders stand accused of distorting religious doctrines to preach about the afterlife, often leading followers to death in their hundreds. But how do cults lure in members, even convincing them to take their own lives? This week on the program, we delve deeper into the mystery of cults, how they work, and why they have been around for so long. I'm Beatrice Marshall. Welcome to Talk Africa. Before we begin our discussion, let's take a look at some of the most notorious cults in the recent past. On November the 18th, 1978, in Jonestown, Guyana, U.S. preacher Jim Jones coerced members of his People's Temple sect into committing revolutionary suicide. Congregants chose or were forced to drink cyanide, leading to the deaths of 914 adults and children. The Aum Shinrikyo cult in Japan is best known for its 1995 attack on the Tokyo subway using sarin poison gas, killing 13, seriously injuring another 54, and perhaps exposing 6,000 people to the deadly poison. On March the 26th, 1997, the dead bodies of 39 Heaven's Gate cult members, including their leader, were found in San Diego, California. They had timed their suicides to the passing of the hale Bob Comet, behind which they believed a spacecraft was traveling to take them to heaven. The suicides seemed to be a result of mixing drugs with vodka and suffocation with plastic bags over their heads. One of the world's worst occult-related massacres took place in southwestern Uganda's Kanungu district in 2000, where some 700 members from the Movement for the Restoration of the Ten Commandments of God burnt to death. Members of the cult, who believed the world would come to an end at the turn of the millennia, had been locked inside a church with the doors and windows nailed shut from the outside. The building was then set ablaze. Well, joining me now to unpack the mystery of cults are from Accra, Reverend Dr. Emmanuel Kwesi Amoafo, PhD, Doctor in Theology and Lecturer in Theology at the Global University in the United States. From Johannesburg, Dr. Alex Asakitipki, Professor and Head of the Department of Sociology at Monash University in South Africa. And with me in studio, Anthony Kahura Mwangi, Pastor at Life Church International in Kenya and also a mentor and corporate speaker. Gentlemen, welcome uh, to the program. Dr. Kwesi, I'd like to start off with you by looking back at the Shakahola cult in Kenya, where over 400 bodies were uncovered in 2023 in one of the worst cult-related tragedies ever. What is your understanding of cultism? Let me maybe give you a definition of cults. There's uh, an article I wrote about cults uh, some years ago, and I'm just going to quote what I wrote uh, in terms of the definition of a cult. A cult is a specific system of religious beliefs and worship that is characterized by intense loyalty and devotion to the leader of the group. And uh, a cult or a heresy is a belief or body of beliefs that is contrary to the orthodox tenets of a religious body. So when you look at the Shakahola situation, that's exactly what you see. You see people who are drawn to a charismatic leader who is teaching a system of religious beliefs and worship and these people display intense loyalty and mm. devotion to the leader of this group so although what he's teaching deviates from orthodox tenets of, of uh, Christianity uh, these people believe what they say what he's saying and he can manipulate and he can do to them what uh, he needs to, he wants to do and in this case he was telling his adherents or his followers that um, if they starve themselves to death 
then they are guaranteed to see Jesus Christ. Now, Dr. Alex, you've studied theology, and when you look at what Dr. Kwesi has talked about, intense loyalty to the leader of the group, where exactly is the line between religion and cultism? I completely agree with what the first speaker has said. Um, in addition to that, the a cultic group is usually operating in isolation of mainstream organizations. So what the cultic leader does is to ensure that he separates his members from other members of the community for the purpose of having total control over them as well as manipulate them to achieve um, desired goals. That is one major um, characteristic of um, the cult group. A second characteristic is that most of the time members do not question the teachings of the leader. Mm -hmm. um, they accept all what the leader, all what the leader says, hook, line, and sinker, um, so that if they are told to do whatever, um, they, they do that. Just as you have in the case of um, Pastor McKenzie, um, as well as um, 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 Jim Jones um, in the United States. So these are some of the key characteristics that we see um, amongst court groups. Anthony, I want to get your experience here because you've been involved in what could be described as a cult in your earlier days. What led you into it? Um, the first thing is I was seeking for the truth and I really wanted to understand the, the scriptures for myself. And when I joined this movement, they, they read what I believed in and they had deeper truth. The second thing, they criticized any other religious organization. They made it look like all these other guys are wrong. We are the only carriers of the truth. And you are so privileged to be among us. You are among the chosen few that God has set aside for you to hear this truth. Uh, there is a level of charisma, charisma in terms of demonstration of power, mm -hmm. meaning that these are people who will heal the sick. These are people who will perform some levels of miracles. And then uh, the other thing is there was a lot of parallelism in terms of what was happening in the globe now and trying to pick scriptures and verify. Like there was a lot of end time teaching mm -hmm. where they justified the world is coming to an end and they will, you know, come up with newspaper cuttings mm -hmm. and news cuttings and show you, you see the war is there. This is the beginning of the old world war. After this war, this and this will happen. The world is coming to an end. So they will sell you fear, sell you hopelessness, and they'll make sure that they separate you from everybody that speaks sense. When you demonize any other source of faith, it automatically tells you you are just listening to one voice. They also demonized the social system. Mm -hmm. They made us believe the TV was wrong. The TV was doctrinating us in the wrong way. Mm -hmm. No radio, no entertainment, nothing. You wake up, go to church, and hear what they needed you to you hear. You are cut off from the outside world. You are cut off from the outside world. How did you get out? What, wh when did you decide you had to get out? And, and what were some of the circumstances that led you to want to leave? The, the first thing I said, you know, this is amazing truth. This truth should be deliberating. The advantage at that time, I was also reading my own Bible. And I asked them, why should we watch people die, yet we have the truth? Mm -hmm. and, and I felt, you know, some of your means are wrong. Then one day, uh, we had a meeting at the cult's leader. And when we got to his house, he had a television, he had a radio, and he had a car. And I was asking myself, we shouldn't be having these things then. Why do you have this thing? And he said, for me, I need to know what is happening in the world so that I can tell you. Mm -hmm. I think that was my wake-up call. And I realized this is deception, this is isolation, and this is mind control and manipulation. So I decided to dig deeper about the person that they were talking about and the one that we were following, and also paralleling it with the scriptures. And I discovered I was so lost and I was wrong. I'd lost relationship with my parents to some level concerning faith. Uh, to a point that at home nobody wanted us to discuss faith. When that matter came up, I became very aggressive, very radical, and I demonized everyone to a point that I sometimes even used to live alone. So that was my wake-up call when I found that the leader was actually not doing what he was telling us to do and the sacrifices that he had made us to pursue. He was not really doing that. Dr. Alex, you've heard what uh, Anthony's experience. What are your thoughts? Incidentally, that is the broad narrative of those who become victims to cult groups. Um, 
just what he has said is what is replicated everywhere for those who are in the cult um, so that they become antagonistic even to their family members as uh, he just narrated. Um, incidentally, it is something that is so pervasive because once one is drawn into the cultic group, it becomes extremely difficult to extricate oneself from it. And uh, that is why they always want to ensure that there is some degree of isolationism. They want to make sure that they are the ones that are totally in control. Mm -hmm. So what we see most of the time is that most members, they do not only worship there, they also, they also have their living there, they sleep there. Some of them are denied from going to schools. Some of them actually give out their worldly belongings and donate everything to the cult group. So it is something that is so pervasive. And the point he made is very important. Right. He was searching for the truth. And that is one of the lure that is so common today. But it is not just searching for the truth. There are those who are searching for healing. There are those who are searching for economic emancipation. There are those who are, they are just lost, what we refer to in sociology as a state of numblessness, anomie. So they are looking for meaning to their lives. And unfortunately, because of that, they become vulnerable to these uh, cultic groups because they also send people out to recruit members. Once they are able to achieve that promise, they, they, they have sold to a potential member that they can answer the eternal whys of why this is happening to them, why this is, doing, what this, why this is going on in the world they are able to easily recruit such members and then they become firm members who themselves go out to recruit other members. So Anthony, what does the church think about uh, religious cultism? What, what, what is the position of the church here? Of course, the position of the church is number one, you need to be a student of the Bible. Don't be a false believer. Because if anyone is mandated to interpret the Bible for you, that person will mislead you. So it's an encouragement also to interrogate every teaching. It's an encouragement also to test every spirit. It's an encouragement also to go and analyze any organization and any movement, especially them that tend to look like they are going beyond the, the principles and the doctrines of the scripture. And yet there is still religious cultism, you know, ongoing, but the church doesn't speak much about it. The problem here is, you know, when it comes to definition of faith and how people operate in their faith, it becomes a little bit technical because worship is a right. So I may not worship the way you worship, you may not worship the way I worship, mm -hmm. and most of these cultic leaders are under the umbrella that we are Christians, but when you go now to the teachings, you discover what they are teaching is totally different. Also remember, going to a certain organization is voluntary. Even the Shakahola menace, the point was very clear, the man moved and the people followed. So it becomes very difficult when people are following a false person and it's out of their own volition. So we are dealing with the human will. So we will do the teaching, we'll do the analysis, such shows will come and bring awareness, mm -hmm. but you'll still be surprised. Someone will still go to a cult, even with this information. Dr. Kwasi, some analysts point out that cults prey upon the vulnerabilities of people, our need for acceptance, to be part of a group, to connect. What exactly makes a cult members unquestionably loyal? And how does that indoctrination happen? Well, as Anthony said, you know, he was in a period in his life when he felt he was seeking the truth. So m many of these people, are, are, um, are they're going through overwhelming emotional, marital, financial, or family crisis, and they're looking for truth. So when these cults come along and they say, oh, we have the solution for you. Don't go to these no other churches. They're telling you lies. This is why you're suffering, and so on. These people are ready for that, you see. And so they, they, they embrace this, uh, this, uh, this, this lure, these lies of these leaders unquestionably. And um, again, as Anthony said, many people, many church-going people don't really take time to read the Bible and to study it for themselves, you see. So when somebody comes twisting the scripture to present a message which is actually contrary to the truth of the scripture, they end up believing it. Now, I must add that one other problem mm -hmm. is that today 
many, many, many large churches have themselves deviated to teaching the false prosperity doctrine, as well as, you know, just asking the members to bring money to the church leaders and so on, which many people, uh, many thinking people find unattractive. So when these false teachers come along and they offer their solution, which of course is no solution at all, they, they easily uh, are drawn into these things. All right, gentlemen, very interesting discussion there, but we are going to take a short break. And when we come back, we will continue our discussion on the mystery of cults. To stay with us. Welcome back to Talk Africa. Still with me, uh, Reverend Dr. Emmanuel Kwasi Amuafo, Dr. Alex Asatipi, and Anthony Mwangi. Before the break, we explored how cults are formed. Let's now examine whether there's been any successful anti-cult effort and what can be learned from them. Anthony, the issue of uh, religious cultism is not uh, confined to one region. You know, there was uh, the Tokyo's Om Shirin Kyo, Uganda's Kanugu cult, the Branch <coughs> Davidians, in the United States, are there specific demographics or communities or regions that are more susceptible to cultism? Um, I will say when I look at Africa, because of our poverty levels and our um, spirituality dynamics, we tend to become a very accessible target for some of these cultism uh, stories. But I believe it's a global phenomenon because when I look at the West also, uh, as early as 1844, there was something called the Great Disappointment, whereby people waited for the coming of Jesus as early as that. Mm -hmm. And it is not in a demographic setup. It's anywhere people who are seeking solutions for life and answers for life, irrespective of their economic status. Um, in Africa, we see them emerging because of our poverty. People are seeking help. And what has dominated some of the known cults in Africa is the concept of what we call escapism theology. Like uh, there is a better place called heaven, which is biblically true, but now the way it is taught is like we are escaping the realities of this world. Looking at the demographic also in poverty, people are doing everything but there are no results. And so you tend to lean or cling towards uh, what I call of a spirituality of life. You are looking for solution, you've gone to school, you're working very hard, things are not happening, and you tend to believe there must be spiritual forces that are actually against my life, and there is a spiritual pattern that needs operation need to be done. Mm -hmm. And automatically you veer off from biblical teachings and you end up entering into rituals and practices and ordinances that are not even biblically accurate. So Africa becomes a victim. I'm not aware of the other nations, but I've studied it in the African context. Dr. Krasi, let me get your thoughts here. Um, uh, is cultism an African concept, or is it something imposed on the continent? Well, as you said earlier, you had Jim Jones in the United States. Um, you had uh, the Davidian Koresh, David Koresh, the Davidian cult, also in the United States. Uh, we've had, uh, we've had uh, this thing in, um, even in Europe. In Germany, there was a cult leader who lured many women into his cult and so on. So it's a global phenomenon um, that draws people who are vulnerable, people who are needy, people who are disillusioned with the church, and, and who are searching for a greater knowledge and so on. So it is global, but as, as Anthony said, in Africa we're particularly vulnerable because of our material um, situation, you know, the poverty that is endemic in our, in our, in our cultures, in our communities, where uh, people, Africans are very religious people. So already we are prone to accepting a religious leader who steps forth and says, oh, I have the solutions. You see, because we naturally, we, we are naturally religious, we come from a very religious background, we are particularly vulnerable, especially when you add all the needs we have that uh, the churches seem not to be providing solutions for. So whatever these leaders 
uh, offer or whatever they tell them to do, they do it. You know, bring all your property. You will not need it anyway. Right. You know, like this Shakahola fellow. You know, the, where did he get all this money from? He got it from these hapless victims, you see. So he bought this huge truck of land and, 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 and forced these people to starve themselves to death. So, so, so yes, yeah, so we are particularly vulnerable in Africa because of our poverty and because of our deeply religious, uh, traditional uh, traditionally religious background. Dr. Alex, I want to address that question of the doomsday quality involved because we talk about involvement of large groups of people. For instance, in Kenya, in the Shakahola issue, over 400 deaths, 900 in Kanungu in Uganda, 909 deaths in the Branch Davidian sect. How do these activities go undetected for so long? And why is there a doomsday quality to this all? Why is there the end of it is death? I think it's important to put this in context. Um, the, I think one of the major tools of the cultic leaders use is that concept of fear. They want to use fear to drive people to themselves. So when they begin to preach the doomsday um, apocalypse uh, um, messages, people become apprehensive, uh, people become fearful, and then they want solution to that. So what do I do? How do I avoid this catastrophe that you are talking about? And then they say, well, we have the solution. You come to our fold, and then you are protected. So that becomes so very important. Um, the second point that you raise is why is it that they don't go undetected? Um, in actual fact, because they live amongst us in the society, people know about them, but there are always challenges. Here in South Africa, we are doing some work with um, the, the Chapter 9 Constitution, the CRL Rights Commission, has been empowered by the Constitution to investigate cases that are brought to the Commission. And because of that, they are able to nip some of these problems in the board. In some other countries where you don't have such regulatory body or watchdog, if you like, um, it just goes on unabated and it only becomes a problem when we lose um, innocent lives. All right, I want to get your final thoughts as we wind up uh, the program. And let me start off with you, Dr. Kwasi. Can cultism be prevented and how should it be prevented? Yes, cultism can be prevented in two ways. First, the church needs to return to preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, the content of the gospel and the implications of the gospel. Because every spiritual we need we have is fulfilled in and through Christ, through the gospel. Secondly, governments have a duty to protect their citizens from these false leaders. And the way to do that is to ensure that any religious organization that springs up is part of a larger religious body that is duly accountable and uh, transparent in its teaching and so on. In Rwanda today, you cannot just get up and form and just sit, uh, uh, particularly in Rwanda, you cannot just get up and form a little church in a corner somewhere. The government does not allow that. Now, there is an organization in Uganda called the Africa Center for Apologetics Research. This is an organization that specializes in helping churches and government and church organizations to deal with cults, to address cults. This organization helps people to know how to draw or to bring their loved ones out of cults. So these are the kind of things that we need to save and to protect our people who are, or are trapped in cults. Dr. Alex, as you wind up the program as well, should cultism be prevented? And more importantly, is the church culpable in the growth of religious uh, cultism? Yes, I think so. And I agree completely with the um, question regarding the various aspects of helping to curb um, cultic practices in Africa. Uh, but in addition to those ones is also the issue of uh, poverty. That the more poverty we have on the African continent, the more cultic groups will spring up. That is almost certain. Because when people are in dire situation, 
they become desperate and in their desperation they become vulnerable. So uh, African leaders, in one major way they can begin to think of curbing um, cultic practices is to ensure that citizens have gainful employment. But secondly, and I think this is very important, it is not just poverty. The, the culture of hedonism that is becoming so pervasive on the African continent and globally is also an issue. I know of young, young people who are actively seeking for cultic groups so that they, through their rituals and whatever they perform, they will have access to resources and other forms of flamboyant uh, lifestyle. The obscene display of wealth is something that is driving the young ones to, de to, de to desperately seek for ways they can become also wealthy. And once they are told that um, joining this group, right. you are guaranteed that you become wealthy, then they become vulnerable. So those are some of the things we can also consider. Right. So, um, Anthony, you have the final word. And I also want to hear your views if the church have, has failed here. I'll say the church has not failed. The church needs to be empowered. There are many umbrella bodies that cover, like we have the Catholic Church, we have the uh, Presbyterian, we have the Evangelicals. They need to be empowered in a way that anyone that opens a church is under aid of these vetted umbrella bodies because regulation of the church cannot be done by the state. That will be considered as persecutions. And cults love it when you hate them. That gives them the power to grow because they'll say, we told you the world will hate us, we are being persecuted, this is the truth, we'll die for it. So when we have regulatory bodies, it's easy now to call out the Mackenzies and tell them what you're teaching is not in the Bible, we give you the first warning second, and after that now we can take legal action. The final thing is also, um, you know, for the government, I believe it's very key for it to permit laws um, that tend to control whatever we call freedom of worship. Because I know when freedom is not managed, mm -hmm. then there are so many loopholes that are opened up. And finally, I believe when you pursue a path as a person, as an individual, you just need to understand what you're pursuing. Because even the heaven we talk about, it's not created by a man even as we are desiring to go there. So you just need to know your stuff and know it very well. But it is possible to curb it. And what the government did in Kenya is amazing, just to point it out. But the sad reality, we have still many ministries with cultic tendencies, but the government will still say it's freedom of worship. When the church calls them out, they say, these are how we interpret the Bible, and you have no right to tell us how to view the Bible and how to behave. So it's possible, and I know it's going to be something accomplished in our land and in Africa. All right, gentlemen, thank you all so much for that very insightful discussion. But that's all we have time for on this edition of Talk Africa. A big thank you to my guests, Reverend Dr. Emmanuel Kwesi Amuafo, PhD doctor in theology and lecturer in theology at a global university in the United States. Dr. Alex Asatipki, professor and head of the Department of Sociology at Monash University in South Africa. And Anthony Kahura Mwangi, pastor and founder of Life a Church International here in Kenya and also a mentor and corporate speaker. Remember, you can be a part of this conversation online through our social media handles on Facebook and X, the platform formerly known as Twitter. You can also catch the show on our YouTube playlist. Do keep the conversation going and join us again next week for more Talk Africa. For me, Beatrice Marshall and the team here in Nairobi, goodbye for now.